Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Garden Party. We're your virtual series from the Southern California News Group here to give you tips, tricks, and insights into getting the most joy and productivity out of your gardening experience and also maybe help you find a community of like-minded green thumbs, or in my case, wannabe green thumbs. Uh, but today we're talking about all things citrus with our gardening columnist, Joshua Siskin. By the way, I'm Sam Dunn. I'm the senior editor of premium content here for the Southern California News Group. And I wanna thank all of you who are Reader Reward subscribers who've made our ongoing virtual program so popular. And by the way, if you are a Reader Reward subscriber attending today, you're automatically entered to win a $100 gift certificate to Home uh, Depot, which should come in really handy. And hey, if you're not a subscriber, why aren't you a subscriber? Go to scng.com forward slash subscribe to find your local paper and join us as a subscriber. Um, before we get started today, I need to tell you a few things. One, uh, if you're an attendee, you're muted, but if you have questions, and we hope you do, please use the Q&A feature on the Zoom toolbar on your screen. And certainly if you wanna make comments, use the chat feature found there as well. We've got SCNG's feature editors, Eric Peterson and Vanessa Franco behind the scenes. They're gonna be monitoring the questions and comments and they'll respond as much as possible. We've got a lot of material to cover today. This session will be videotaped and a link is going to be sent to you so you can share or revisit some of your favorite moments and also refer to all of the wonderful information Joshua has for you. It's also posted at scng.com forward slash virtual events where you're going to be able to find all of our past virtual shows and see what's coming up next. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our resident expert right now, Joshua Siskin. He's the gardening columnist at the LA Daily News since 1993. Joshua holds master's degrees in holder, oh, yeah, excuse me, horticulture from UC Davis. He's also been a landscaping and gardening practices instructor for the Los Angeles Unified School District and UCLA Extension. And he owned his own landscape management company. He's also written a book too. It's called Green Plants Under Smoggy Skies, a guide for the Los Angeles garden. And wait, there's more. He's also a licensed psychotherapist, which I like to say is why he's getting to, he's good at getting to the, the root of our gardening issues. Anyway, hello, Joshua. Hello, Samantha. Great to be here again. <laughs> well, it is always so good to, to be here. And today we have a lot of exciting stuff to talk about uh, regarding citrus, the, the quintessential California fruit. Let's first talk a little bit about the, the fascinating history of citrus. Can you run yeah, us right. through it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, let me just say a minute about why is citrus so special. I guess there's things about it we take for granted, but when you sit back and think about it, you realize that it's the juiciest fruit, right? And easy to make juice out of, right? It's the most fragrant fruit, especially the, um, the citron etrog or this beauty, which is the uh, pomelo. I highly, if you want to, if you want to uh, 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 freshen up your kitchen or your or your living room, put a couple of these on the table. The the smell is very very divine. And uh, well, we'll talk a lot about uh, the different types of citrus in just a minute. But but tell us how you know how did it get to be uh, the iconic fruit of Southern California? Right. Really cool. Yeah. It's well, it's a very interesting history. You know, um, it became the iconic fruit really because of. Uh, uh, two people who uh, we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, and it, it, it's because, well, the, the climate in, in Southern California is ideal for citrus. Um, the, uh, the citrus really likes a, a dry, hot summer. That's, right. that's, that's really the bottom line. But it didn't and, come from here, right? It came from somewhere from very far away. Right. So, Julie, can we can we move to the next slides, please? So yeah. maybe give us a little uh, bit about where it comes okay. from. Okay, well, we, we, we're just going to mention this eau de cologne. It's, <laughs> it's sort of a hook to, to, to draw you in. You may not, people may <laughs> not know that eau de cologne is made out of uh, essential citrus oils. And as it was actually an Italian who was a perfume maker and he migrated to Germany and he came up with this idea in Germany. So it's called eau de cologne. You can't grow oranges in Germany, it's too cold. But anyway, that's, uh, that's the story behind that. <laughs> Why do we okay. call them citrus? Right, so there are two uh, theories on this subject. One is that cit cit citrus is, is, uh, comes from the word cedrus, which is Latin for cedar tree. 
And the fragrance of citrus and, and cedar is, is, I guess, uh, vaguely uh, similar. And uh -huh. so that's one of the explanations. And the other is that the citrus is named for citron. Citron, which, which is a, um, uh, a lemon-like fruit, you can see a picture of it here, was sort of like the, uh, the only citrus fruit that was grown in Europe and the Mediterranean for a thousand years. So based on that, they took the word citrus from citron. Interesting. So where does it come from? Oh, here we go. So, so here, here we have the origin. Now the, the, the red, uh, the kind of the brick red color is the citron, right? The citron is like a big, uh, a big uh, uh, lemon. Uh, there's a holiday called Sukkot, which is celebrated after uh, Yom Kippur, five days after Yom Kippur. And we, and we use that fruit as part of the, the, the ceremonial uh, oh. uh, obligations of the holiday. But it, so that's, that fruit comes from the, from the, red, uh, the, the red outlined areas. And then the other major fruits are the pomelo, right? This one, that's from the, that comes from the, uh, the purple uh, area. And then the mandarin comes from the orange area. Okay. And then the green area is the lime. So you see that the citrus, citrus comes from Southeast Asia and what they call uh -huh. the Malay Archipelago, which are all these islands in here, Indonesia, uh, Sumatra, Java, and so on. Yeah. Fascinating, but obviously it made its way west. It did make its way west. Yeah, it did make its way west. And so here you have the, the, the four parent types are on the right. We said the pomelo, which is this, this, this once again, this big uh, fruit here. And then there's the citron, which we mentioned. There's a mandarin, right? Mm -hmm. A mandarin, which, uh, have it up here. No. Anyway, a mandarin, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, from which uh, oranges come. And then you have the papeta, which is a, a, it's just a, a lime kind of a fruit. It's a green fruit. So, and then here you see, one word you could use to describe citrus is promiscuous. <laughs> you can take any two types of citrus trees and bring them together and, and create a, a hybrid. And you can see some of them here that from a pomelo and a mandarin, you get a sweet orange, from a bitter orange and a citron, you get a lemon, and a pomelo and a sweet orange, you get a grapefruit, so. There we go. I've, yeah. I've actually never seen a citron before. Yeah. But it, well, apparently it's really key in, in, the, in bringing uh, citrus to the West. So tell us exactly. about that. Exactly. So this is, a, this, is the, this is what happened, how the citron went from Asia to uh, the Middle East. And uh, so the yellow here represents the citron. There are two reasons that the citron uh, dominated. One is because you can see it has a very thick peel. So it lent itself to movement uh, West. And the other is that um, it, uh, 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 it, uh, it, it, um, the thick skin, and then also because it was the most Western fruit, so it was the, the easy, the, the, the most likely to be transported. Um, and it, it, it's very interesting because they think they found seeds of the citron as, as early as, as 2000 years ago in Persia, but they're not sure that there were trees growing there, why? Because uh -huh. if you only find the seeds, it doesn't mean they grew the trees. You have to find the pollen. Yeah. If you don't find the pollen, because these, this fruit was like a gift item. It was the elite fruit of that period. So when uh, one king would, would gift another king with a citron, okay? And the seeds were preserved, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that king who received it grew it himself. Anyway. Fascinating. So, here, so then, so our... So it arrives to the new world then from Europe. Right. So, yeah. So the Spanish uh, and the Portuguese brought uh, citrus to uh, North America and South America. Mm -hmm. And they actually got it first by going to India. See that they would take a, 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 you know, they would go all the way to India and they would bring the fruit back and it ended up in the Americas. Columbus brought lemon seeds to the Caribbean. Ponce de Leon brought uh, seeds, orange seeds to uh, Florida. And the first uh, incidence of, of, of citrus growing was in the mission San Diego in 1796. And then in the San Gabriel mission in 1804, the, the, the missions were the, center, the horticultural centers of California. 
not only that they grew, they grew fruit trees, they grew vegetables. And so it was from the missions really that the, the, the first citrus were, were, were planted and, and people heard about them. But and this was a fascinating, a, yeah, the, the navel <laughs> orange. Please tell us about that. Yeah, well, the navel orange. So Eliza Tibbetts was, um, was living in Washington, D.C., actually. And um, she befriended someone there who was very prominent in the United States Department of Agriculture. When she moved to California, the, this individual received uh, um, navel orange uh, buds from South America, where somebody, somebody went out to a tree and they saw a navel orange growing on that tree. Okay, this was in the 1800s. We got very excited about that. And someone decided, an American was down there, they decided, okay, we're gonna send back some budwood, right? To clone the tree, right? They wanted to clone it. So they sent back some budwood and they, and they grafted it onto some seedlings in Washington, DC in a greenhouse, right? And after those grafts took, they were sent to California and they arrived by stagecoach. And that state, it, it, they arrived in San Francisco and they were sent down to Gilroy. And then Eliza Tibbetts went up to Gilroy and she brought the, the seedlings back. She planted them in Riverside and they had a county fair where people were sampling these fruit and they were going out of their minds with, uh, with glee. It was, they've never eaten something so juicy, had no seeds and they just couldn't get over it. And within a very short time, uh, there was Oranges thousands, became the thousands thing. of acres. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, those then, were some hardy saplings, weren't they? Anyway, but move, move yeah, on. I'm forward, sorry, I, was, I, I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt you, but you were just about to talk about uh, Valencia oranges. What? Yeah, so in in uh, the Valencia orange was also invented in Southern California, uh, not well the developed the uh, the navel was, but the, the Valencia was hybridized by somebody named William Wolfskill in Santa Ana, okay, and uh, he. He sold that patent eventually to the Irvine Ranch that planted a hundred square miles of Valencia trees. It's almost boggles them. Sixty-four thousand acres. I live in the city of Orange, so I right. so yeah, the, you know. the 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 you know the history still lives with us today. Yeah, um, yeah you know we think about it as the iconic California fruit, really. Right. Um, but let, let's uh, move forward. Yeah, so here, so, so citrus has questions. a lot to do with the growth of agriculture in California in general, because mm -hmm. the whole idea of a packing house was invented by citrus growers, where you have boxes and you put fruit in boxes and you send it. I mean, we take that for granted. That was invented. They, they even had individual sleeves for each fruit. I mean, they were that valuable. Okay. Yeah. And uh, they, 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 they had railroad cars. The railroad, when the railroad, when the transcontinental railroad was finished, made a huge difference because they started shipping oranges to the Midwest. It would take a month to send them, but they had ice in the cars that kept them. Anyway, uh, so when we're talking about California versus Florida oranges, the I've always is, wondered about this. Yeah, what is Okay, so, so the difference is this. The difference is really in the look for one thing, but the re, so First of all, if you want to have oranges all year round, so you, you, you plant a navel and a Valencia because of a, a navel is, uh, is going to be around from, let's say, November to May, and Valencia from May to November, okay? So the reason, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, the navel orange grows a lot better in a dry climate. It couldn't handle the wet winter, you know, the wet climate right. of, of um, they don't grow well in Florida at all. Okay. The other reason being that 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 the the wetness uh, disfigures the fruit. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when people want to buy a fruit that they're for 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 fresh consumption, they want it to look nice. Okay. It doesn't matter what a Valencia orange looks like. Why? Because it's used for juice. And uh -huh. also, the Valencia oranges in Florida are much sweeter than the ones grown in California. The tropical weather, <coughs> excuse me, influences the uh, the sweetness. Okay. Speaking of cold, we had quite a an episode yesterday, and so I'm I'm sure that people are mm. wondering about how their plants can tolerate this kind of weather. Yeah, right. So the um, the order of the cold tolerance is uh, with the the most cold tolerant is the Satsuma mandarin and the kumquat. Okay, 
and then the grapefruit, and then the sweet orange, and the lemon, and the lime. And we're really talking about the cold tolerance of the trees. The fruit can be damaged, even when the weather is freezing or maybe a little bit above freezing. But the trees, any, most citrus trees can handle a freeze. The question is how long it is, okay? Uh -huh. And uh, Satsuma, Man they, Satsuma Manor and a kumquat could handle a freeze down to 20 degrees, okay? The tree, that is. The, tree, the fruit could be damaged, but what you really care about is the tree. And then the other fruits are, are you know, less, uh, less cold tolerant. Grapefruit would be less, sweet orange less than that, lemon and lime. Lime is the most uh, cold sensitive. It's something very interesting. Why is citrus different color? Why are limes green? <laughs> yeah, and, why are they? Well, I'll tell you the reason, it's a very interesting point. <laughs> the reason limes are green actually is because the, it's the colder, the cold temperature is what turns uh, citrus color. In, tr in the tropics, oranges are often green, okay? Or greenish yellow. They don't churn that, that you don't see this color of a, of, a, of a citrus fruit in the tropics, okay? So the, because the lime is so, if it was cold enough to turn the lime yellow and green uh, and orange, the, yeah. the tree would be dead. I you see the problem there? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, well, we, before we move forward, since we were just talking about the Satsuma uh, fruit, we have a question oh. from Rick H. And that is, this last season, my Satsuma fruit peels were very difficult to remove. They were attached to the fruit, which was juicy and tender. Every other year, the peels were easy to remove. This tree is a dwarf and in a very large container. It has produced uh, excellent crops year after year. Rick says he uses regular fertilizer with organic citrus, uh, citrus fertilizer. Any help right. here? Yeah. So I think they're probably over fertilizing. If you put on too much fertilizer, you create, you know, the, the thickness of the, of the, of the uh, uh, skin of the peel is affected. And, and also yeah. the attachment, you know, the, uh, the little uh, uh, fibers that would attach. So yes. I would say, especially in a container, you can be too uh, zealous when it comes uh -huh. to fertilizing. So you want to back off on that. That's a great one. I'm sorry. Well, let, let's get to the protection measures you were just talking yeah, about. Yeah, so, so this is something that a lot of people probably don't know. But if, if a freeze is forecast and you want to protect your citrus tree, you turn on the sprinklers, right? Mini sprinklers are best because they see the most important thing is the trunk, that you keep the trunk uh, from freezing. And the way you do that is by applying water to the trunk, which many sprinklers would do. And you say, well, what is going on here? The reason is that when water turns to ice, there's something called heat of fusion. That heat is released. Whenever something has changed, changes state from a, from a liquid to a solid or a liquid to a gas. <coughs> and there's also something called heat of evaporation. So water's, water's also turning to water vapor. So that's the reason that you that you put the sprinklers on when when a freeze is uh, is forecast. Um, and then our windbreak is very important because too much wind will uh, um, will destroy the uh, the blossoms and you won't you won't get a crop of, of fruit. And last but not least, you want to paint the trunks of young trees with a white latex paint if it's okay. if it's in an area where the sun really is is intense. Because the white paint will reflect the um, will reflect the sun. Well, refle reflect the sun and keep it from from getting right, keep it from burning. Yeah, I right. mean burning. Fruit, you know, you do have sometimes you have burned uh, fruit on on, right. on uh, and there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, we have so many questions here. I just I I want to get to this question since we already talked about um, you're talking about citrus loves heat, but related to that is irrigation. Um, Patricia right. Okada asked. Uh, she she says she uses a drip irrigation system. Do the citrus does citrus have deep or shallow root systems? And how long and how often should she irrigate on average? Okay, so you know that that that's the that's a, that's the ultimate question. First of all, right. citrus has shallow, it has shallow roots. Tropical okay. trees have shallow roots because the soil in tropical countries people don't know this, but the the soil in the tropics is really lousy soil. It's very shallow. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much rain and all everything everything is 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 drained out of it, okay. Okay. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Now mm -hmm. they say when you water a citrus tree, it's the water should soak down to a depth of two feet, ideally. Okay. What that means is 
you can take a slowly trickling hose and put it in what's called the in, around the tree. You may want to move it here. That's probably the simplest way of watering a citrus tree to make sure it gets soaked really, really well. Okay. And you probably do that. It's it's so hard to say, you know, a young tree that you just planted, you want to water probably you probably have to water almost every day, right? A little yeah. bit. But as the tree grows, you water less and less. Um, one point I have to make is that mulching is very important. You have to have a, like a three to four inch layer of mulch. You won't have to water as much, right? We're talking about compost, we're talking about wood chips, we're talking about straw, anything at all you can put on. Um, to answer the question, so when the soil is dry at a four inch depth, you wanna water, okay? I, there's something called a soil probe, which you can put into the, you can sink it into the soil and you can see how deep the, the moisture is. You pull out a soil yes. sample, right? Looks like uh -huh. a tea, right? And that will tell you at what depth the soil is moist. Um, it's really, look, it's really a trial and error kind of a situation. You, you have, you get to know your tree, so to speak. If you see the leaves start to curl, then you know for sure it needs more water. But a tree, a mature tree should, should never need to be watered more than twice a month if it's well soaked. I don't care how hot the weather gets. Um, and at least in Southern California, maybe it's different in Arizona, but um, citrus trees, as they, as they mature, are actually drought tolerant. They're considered to be drought tolerant. You yeah, don't well, have speaking to of, out of the water. You yeah, really speaking of which, you're just about to talk about how citrus loves heat, which is great because right, we have right. so, a lot of it. So this is a very important point. Yeah, because people say, well, how much light or how much? Citrus has to have at least six hours of light every day. Okay. But if you can't get it that, then you need to have it in an area where it gets reflected heat because it's really the heat that ripens the fruit more than the. Um, more than the uh, 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 the number of hours of light, okay? So if you have four hours of light, but let's say you have a tree and it's surrounded by concrete, right? You have it on a patio deck or you planted it against a block wall even, right? Where you have reflected heat. Or here mm -hmm. we see a trellis situation. You can actually trellis citrus. You can That's trellis lemon. Yeah, I, I, and so I the, heat, seen that the heat from the wall behind it will radiate, right? And ripen the fruit in that manner if you don't have your six hours every day. Speaking um, of which, we, we've t talked a little bit about fertilization. I think we're gonna talk about yeah, more. Yeah. So, we're so, gonna talk about, ir wait, just one second. We, we've we talked about irrigation a little bit. We've talked about, we've talked about uh, exposure, uh, light exposure. Donna Bignell wants to know, is it possible to improve the flavor of fruit on my orange tree? Is any of this related to improving the flavor? Yeah. So so. The longer you leave your fruit on the tree, the sweeter it gets. Uh -huh. That's that's the upside, and that's one of the real advantages of growing citrus too, that you 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 can store it on the tree. You know, you can leave it citrus fruit on the tree for months. The downside is if you leave too if you leave it on too long, then the next year's crop is not going to be as large. Oh, so okay. That's like the downside because what what does it mean? It's taking resources away from new growth that would produce more flowers in, in, the, in the following year. So there's, you know, there's a well, profit and loss. There's a, uh, there's a trade-off. Um, but yeah, it does get sweeter the longer you leave it on the tree, especially grapefruit. Grapefruit is known for that, becoming sweeter yes. the longer you leave it on the tree. Yeah. We have a grapefruit question actually from, from an anonymous attendee who says, I have had an Oro Blanco grapefruit tree for about 25 plus years and it has given wonderful large sweet grapefruit however in the last two to three years the fruit has become quite smaller and the tree is less prolific any ideas about that yeah um i would say that uh it probably has to do something with our intense heat i would mm -hmm. you know and trees become more uh what should i say trees are less um uh, robust as they mm -hmm. age I mean, 25 years is, for a grapefruit, grapefruits are not as sturdy as, as oranges. You, you seldom hear of a grapefruit tree that, that's 50 years old, but, but you do hear of, of uh, 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 orange trees that are 50 years old. Not, that's not unusual uh -huh. at all, like they can live over uh -huh. 100 years. But, so yeah, I would say that probably it has to do with its, um, that, that grapefruits are not that, not that long lived. 
And I would also, um, I would also look into the, the surrounding conditions. You know, sometimes things change. Like maybe there are trees in the area that grew up that they didn't, <laughs> they're not getting as much sun as they used to. I mean, that's always a possibility. And I would also wonder if, uh, if there could be something going on with the roots when they're 25 years old. When you say you have a number of trees, perhaps there's interference with the roots uh, after all this time because they are shallow rooted, right? And so they can easily grow into each other or maybe there are plants nearby. It's an interesting point about the water. If you have um, a lawn, for instance, you're gonna to have to water 20% more because the lawn is gonna take water away from the citrus. Uh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Well, well, that kind of feeds into, if you will, the fertilization question, doesn't it? Let's, right, let's right. talk a little bit more about uh, that. I have a lot of numbers up here, which I'm, you know, if you wanna go back and, and look at it, I'm not gonna go into the numbers right now, but how do you get 1.6 pounds of actual nitrogen, which then you will divide into three or four applications during the year. Rule of thumb is every six weeks during the growing season, you, uh, you, uh, you fertilize, which is four times, I think, uh, beginning of, uh, end of January, beginning of uh, March, end of, end of April, beginning of June. But you can also do it like this. Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, and Father's Day. That's an easy way to remember. So once you Valentine's have your- Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, and Father's Day. Those yeah, that's three... easy to remember. <laughs> yeah. So once yeah, you have yeah. your quantity, once you have your quantity, which I which I calculated here based on the percentage in the back, you would divide that by three, right? If you need 10.6 pounds for the year, you divide it by three. So each time you use like, you know, three, three and a half pounds. Um, and, um, and that's it. Uh, sounds good. I should mention, I should mention that older trees, a lot of people do not fertilize once a tree has a certain size and they seem to get good crops. So it's not, uh, it's not done by everyone, but you will get a better crop if you do fertilize. Now, not everybody is growing citrus in a yard. Some of us are growing citrus on patios and, and right, other, you right, know, right. smaller so, places. So, what about containers? So the container, first of all, you are kind of limited in, in your choices. The best plant to grow in a container is a Meyer lemon because it's a, it's a tree that doesn't get too big. And it's a, a Meyer lemon is like a mild lemon. It's actually a lemon that was, uh, it's, it's, it was uh, one of its parents is an orange. So that explains the sweetness of a, of a Meyer lemon. Um, and another, another one you can plant, a kumquat is good. A kumquat is good, a lime quat. A lime quat is a hybrid of a lime and a kumquat. So you can either plant a, a kumquat, a lime quat, a Meyer lemon, or also a, um, a tangelo, okay? Oh, I love tangelos. Tangelo. The, yeah. they, these trees are reasonably, reasonably uh, sized. They don't, they don't get incredibly large, like, like an orange or a grapefruit would. Well, okay, how... I, we, have a, we have a question really quick related to having uh, plants in containers. When is the best, uh, uh, we have a question from Diana Offen. She says, she bought several citrus plants and she wonders when a good time is to transplant them. Um, mm. Should she remove the buds so that plants can concentrate on creating a good root system or is it okay? Right. To let you it say that, yeah. So the, initially you take, yeah, take off the fruit because you want it. Now is she's going to take them. Okay. So I, I'm assuming she's been, she's going to take them out of the containers and plant them in the ground. Correct. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. So the first few years you remove the fruit. The reason you have fruit in a container, by the way, is because the plant is stressed. And when a plant is stressed, it flowers and it fruits, okay? Because it thinks it's gonna die. And all it cares about is reproducing itself, right? Yeah. But when you take it out of the container and plant it in the ground, a lot of times it won't fruit for a few years, you know, it won't, because it, it's finding its way and it knows, okay, now I'm secure. Uh, I got plenty of room for my roots to grow. Right. So it doesn't put out the fruit. And yeah, but yeah, you, you, so it's really, it's, whether, whether you take off the fruit or not, you're probably not gonna see fruit the next couple of years, but I would take it off because you wanna encourage the roots to grow right away. Cause you don't know, mm -hmm. especially this time. But by the way, summer is the recommended season for planting citrus. Interesting. Because it, it is the time of the year when the roots really wanna grow, not like uh -huh. cold winter plants. 
right? Uh, where they constrict, they're like, expanding in, in the right, world. Right, right. right. We, we generally say that fall is a good time or spring is a good time. But for citrus, the best time to plant is now. Uh, excuse me, what am I saying now? <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I don't know, I get confused here. No, because, you want to plant. Because who knows summer. with this weather, what, what season Yeah, we're really. Anymore. Who knows, who knows? But yeah, no, the truth is that citrus is best planted in the summer. But you know, Southern California is very forgiving. You can plant anything at any time, pretty much, okay? Um, the one thing you want to be a little bit concerned about, though, is if there's a sudden cold freeze and you just planted something, so the new growth is going to be uh, cut okay. back, right? Uh, so that's something to take into account. Before uh, we get to harvesting citrus, we have a question from Mercedes and Cecil, who ask, how soon does orange bear fruit from planting a seed? Ah, uh, it can take up to 10 years. 10 years. <laughs> so you know, it's, a long, it's a long haul. It's a long okay. haul. Okay. Fair enough. But then eventually we do get them. We see them all around. I think yeah, I mentioned to you, my here, neighbors keep some, giving me them. Yeah. And, and here's something very interesting that when you plant a citrus seed, you can get up to three or four seedlings from a, a single seed. It's a very oh, fascinating, it, you know, I don't know if we'll have time to go into it. And okay. most, uh, only one of those is probably uh, uh, a mix of male and female. The rest are clones. So if you plant a citrus seed, you could get an orange exactly like the one that you planted. Fascinating. I love that. So let's talk about harvesting. Oh, we've, we've yeah, got on to biology. That. No, harvesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, we've it's got so much fruit. to go over. Yeah, uh -huh. winter fruit harvest is needed. Um, we talked about this before that they become sweeter with time. So you don't, you don't have to right. be in a panic about getting them all off. But the what I, you know, from what I understand, and by the way, I got a very interesting letter. Somebody who harvests all his oranges at once. And what he does is he juices them. They're Valencia's. He juices them and he puts them into ice cube trays. He puts the juice in that. ice cube trays. And then he puts the, when he takes the ice cubes and he puts them into huge uh, bags, right? In, in the freezer. And he has ice cubes the entire year for his, for his drinks. Well, they're actually juice cubes. <laughs> Ah, that is a very, it. yeah. I so he that. has a huge to harvest every year. Why? Because he harvests everything at once, right? Which, like we said, you don't have to do. You can keep the fruit on. But by harvesting it early, you ensure that you're going to crop the next year. Because there's something called alternate bearing, where if you harvest late, then you might not, especially with things like tangerines, you may not get any crop the next year. Okay. So that's well, something see, to be aware of. We have a question from Alan Sarkissian who, it, this might be appropriate. My orange tree has produced another bumper crop this year. However, the fruit is smaller than past years. Is this a right. common problem this year in the South Bay or is it something else? Um, no, I mean, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a mixed blessing, right? Because the more fruit yeah. you get, the smaller it's going to be. It's just, you know, sequestering of, uh, of resources, right? Um, okay. a, a tree has, only has so many resources. Some people do thin the fruit on their citrus trees for that reason. And you can even have something called uh, fruit drop, where a lot of fruit just falls from the tree because there's not enough resources um, to, to keep the fruit on the tree, right? Wow, not okay. enough water, not enough fertilizer. Um, so yeah. Yeah, lots of conditions. All right, well, this might be a good time to move on to biology then. Ah. So here, I mean, this is a very, <laughs> so here I have a picture on the left of two seedlings coming out of a single seed. And so this is from um, what they call polyembryonic um, seeds. That means, see the fertilization of, 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 uh, of, of, any, of any plant happens when the male anther sheds pollen onto the female stigma and the, uh, the, the, anth the, the pollen grows a, a tube. You can see the, the female part in the middle. It grows a tube all the way down to the bottom of the, uh, of the uh, what's called a style. And then the, 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 the male genetic material from the pollen is released into the ovule, which you see here at the bottom of the, of, uh, of the what's called, what's known as the ovary, and they unite, okay? Now, in citrus, it's something happening, something is very unusual. And that is that 
embryos just arise automatically from the female tissue, from the, from the uh, ovary. And yeah, you can see the ovary on the left. And so they will, they will join with that other embryo that's, that's sexually produced from the male and the female. So you'll have maybe three or four or five or even more seedlings in a single seed, okay? And that's a, that's a very unusual process. That's you don't, I, actually, you see that in mangoes. If you take a mango seed and plant it, you will see yeah. also a number of embryos. So it doesn't only happen in citrus, okay? So that we call polyembryo. Yeah, okay. Sweet oranges. So now we're going into the nitty gritty of the different types of oranges. So the navel, I don't know if you've ever been into the navel, but you see at the bottom, when you open the navel orange at the bottom on the right, you have um, that little, those little, they're you know, like little pieces of, uh, you know, of citrus pieces. That's yes. actually, that's, it's actually another orange that was aborted, okay? Interesting. The navel wow. orange consists of two oranges, right? It consists of, a, of, of the orange, and that's most of the flesh that you see. And then at the bottom, there's those, those, those little pieces, and that's an orange that didn't, um, that wasn't, uh, that didn't grow to completion, right? And so you actually have two oranges in one, and because of that, uh, uh, that incomplete orange, you end up with the navel at the, at the bottom of the fruit. Um, so well, we have, a, yeah. we have a lot of questions about, uh, and I think we're going to get into this, but we have a lot of questions about why trees are not being sold in the Orange County area. Why, right. why right. you, what are, where do sumo fruits come from and why can't I buy a tree? What's going on there? Yeah, Roger? right. So there's a disease called Quanglong Bing, HLB or citrus greening. And what that, so there's a, it started in Florida in 2005. And what happened yeah. was there is an insect, it's called a psyllid. It's similar to an aphid. It, I mean, it, it looks a little bit about the same size. Um, this insect vectors or transmits a bacterial disease, a, a bacteria. It goes into the, it goes mm -hmm. into the tree and mm -hmm. the tree starts to decline and the tree eventually dies. There's no cure mm -hmm. for it. 80% of the trees in Florida have been affected. Ah, okay, so there here, okay. So here we have a picture. All those blue areas are now quarantined. You cannot buy a citrus tree. It's very ironic, because two of the area, Riverside and Santa Ana, the home of the navel The orange, home of them, wow. <laughs> you can't buy wow. citrus trees. But what you can do is go outside the areas and buy a citrus tree and bring it back. Okay, mm -hmm. the, the, the danger is that you would remove citrus from these quarantine areas to other areas. So if, for instance, if you have some citrus on your tree in, in Riverside or Santa Ana and you wanna give it to friends who live outside the area, that's a problem. I mean, I, if you scrub it really, really well, you know, you might be okay. But then again, in a naval orange, they could be, they could be hiding out in here. Uh -huh. You're probably better off not moving it out, you know, have your, yeah. your friends <laughs> Well, but, that um, begs the question uh, re related to this. That begs the question, and we have a few of them. Mercedes and CISO has one recommended insecticide for for citrus. Okay, so by the time this, you know, by the time you see this, it's probably too late. Yeah, what well, well, these little uh -huh. bugs here? I mean, uh -huh. they probably infected the tree. Now there are insecticides. You know, usually what we what we uh, what we suggest is uh, either horticultural oil or insecticidal soap, because these are non-toxic um, preparations that suffocate the insect, okay? And those are probably the most uh, widely used. Some people just take dish soap. You know, you can find all these recipes online. They take a couple of drops of dish soap with water or maybe olive oil, and they, you know, they apply it with a, with a spray bottle, and that, that does a trick. You don't even have to necessarily go out and buy anything. Um, and, uh, but yeah, one of the things that, uh, that you need to be aware of in terms of, of pests on, on, on uh, citrus is the, um, is ants. See, ants will carry insect pests up into a tree, okay? Uh -huh. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Why do they, they do, do that? that? Because, especially aphids. It's funny, we don't, have a, we don't have a picture of aphids here, 
But um, <laughs> everything else, but <laughs> everything, everybody takes aphids for granted. But actually, mealybugs, mealybugs would also be uh, uh, candidates, and and scales would too, for that matter. But the because what happens is these insects secrete a substance that the ants eat. That these insects they they suck the sap out of a leaf, okay, and they can't digest it all, so they secrete it. And the sap that they secrete is eaten by the ants, okay? It's a source of nourishment for them. Another thing the ants do is they fight off the predator insects. In other words, if a beneficial insect that would normally dine on a mealybug or a thrips or a wife comes along, the ant will fight it off, you know? And that's so that's why you want to keep ants out of your, out of your citrus trees. Well, this, this uh, also relates, maybe, I don't know, to a question that Nancy Gerhardt says. She has the Satsuma orange tree in her, in her yard and says, last year, the tree had very little fruit. This year, it's loaded. Does, right. does the... So uh, that's, that's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the alternate bearing thing, yeah. So if you want to get more fruit next year, you, you, you want to harvest earlier than later. Because when you okay. harvest later, it takes away from the following year's crop. Interesting. Okay. We have, I'm sorry, we're, we're kind of going all over the place, but there are so many questions. Steve, and we had this on a, a previous slide. Steve Perlman wants to know, what about foliar fertilization? Is that preferred? It's not preferred, but it's very good, especially for what we call micronutrients. Uh -huh. Okay. When you're talking about iron, zinc, magnesium, and, and manganese, it's, it's definitely beneficial. You, I mean, you can do, you, you, you can definitely fertilize your trees for a You don't have to do it through the roots. You can do it through the leaves. Um, and, but generally speaking, we fertilize the basics, which is the nitrogen and the, and the potassium and the phosphorus. You know, the three numbers on the bag, that's yes. generally put around the, the base of the tree. At the drip line, remember, always fertilize at the drip line when you're outside, which is where the water drips off the tree. It's the canopy perimeter, right? That's where yes. you want to put down the fertilizer. And then you would do it if, you know, as needed, right? If you see the leaves are yellow, they're not, you know, coloring up, that's when you put on the micronutrients. Um, but it's, it's a recommended practice for sure. I'm, I'm curious, this is just my own question. We've yeah. talked about pests, we've talked about fertilization, we've talked about all of these elements. If you have everything in line with, with uh, the correct amount of sun, the correct amount of fertilization, the correct amount of irrigation, are those trees going to be more resilient to the pests we were just talking about? That's a great point. Absolutely. 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 Definitely. Okay. Yeah. No, even, yeah, they say that about the citrus greening, you know, if, you're, if your tree is really healthy and vital, it's a much, you know, it has a much better chance of, uh, of, uh, Surviving. staying, 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 you know, staying healthy, right? Just like us, we, right? Same thing. Yeah. Just like us, yeah. exactly. We we have a we have an, an interesting question we haven't talked about yet from Judith Meyer. She says we have we had to remove our Meyer lemon bush because it was cross pollinating with our Valencia oranges. It doesn't seem to be a problem with our red grapefruit cross pollinating with the orange trees. How how do wait, you wait, that? that's, an that's a very interesting. I don't know why that would be a problem. I'm, I'm confused. I don't understand why that cross pollination would be a problem. Um, interesting. She doesn't she doesn't because, elaborate. Because, here, here, here's the point. Here's the point. Okay. Um, this, once you have a certain variety of fruit growing on a tree, that's uh -huh. all you're going to get. Okay. Uh -huh. I don't care. I don't care whether the variability comes in the seeds, right? In other words, uh -huh. if you have a if you have a a, a, a Meyer lemon pollinating a Valencia orange, all the oranges are still going to be Valencias, right? Uh -huh. But the seeds that you would plant from the Valencia could be unusual, right? They could have elements of the Meyer lemon in them. But the fruit itself is never going to be affected. That's already said. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. Going back to a question about um, raising up trees and fertilization, Marita Sensian, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, she asks, how much nitrogen for a new sapling, sapling planted in June? How much sapling for, I would just, put, you know, I put a handful. Look, it, it's, yeah. you go to, a, the easiest thing is to go to a nursery 
and get a bag of citrus fertilizer. And they're going to tell you how much to put on their trees. Okay, you know, it's always on there. Yeah, but I would, I mean, generally they say like, it, dep it depends on how big it, like they say a cup of fertilizer, let's say between 13 and 15% nitrogen. Okay, if you have a 13 to 15% nitrogen, so one cup of fertilizer for a one inch diameter trunk. Okay, uh -huh. so if you're, but I don't know, your seedling could be less than that, but if it's a one inch diameter trunk, which is probably about what you would expect, I think maybe in, a, in a, any young tree, then you just, you just put that one cup of fertilizer, as long as it's only 13, 14, 15% nitrogen, okay? Not higher. You, you wouldn't that. want to put something that's 40% nitrogen, a cup, you know what I'm saying? So you have to, yeah. you have to yeah. be aware of that. And that's the first number of the three, right? NPK, the first number is nitrogen. And nitrogen. Yeah. We have another question that we haven't touched on yet, and that's about pruning. Steve Hampton says, our orange tree is about 30 plus years old, lost right. about a, a third of its leaves, leaving bare branches last year. The bare branches still produced a lot of fruit without the leaves this year. Will the leaves well, return or should he prune back those bare branches? Um, if, if there's no new growth on those branches, I mean, look, as long as fruit is coming out, you know, yeah. don't, don't prune them, you know, don't, don't mess with success. But yeah. um, and generally speaking, I'm glad to bring up that point because citrus is not a heavily pruned tree. People do not prune citrus trees. The ones they prune are lemons. Lemons tend to have dieback where you, you cut up. And, but in older trees, you're going to get some dieback too. And, uh, you know, as long as it's not harming anything and you're getting fruit, keep it going. Keep it going. All right. Fair enough. Uh, we have a question that we haven't touched on yet. Uh, Ryan Kane wants to know, what is the treatment for fungus growth on a lemon tree? Issues of fungus growth. Okay. Now... Yeah, there's so many different types of fungus, but if it's a um, uh, horticultural oil, what they call is a, a a fine horticultural oil is the is generally recommended uh, for fungus. Um, and you know, again, I have to take you have to take a look at it. is it on the fruit, is it on the tree, is it on the leaves? Um, and there, see, there are different types of fungus. There, that's such a broad put. You know, you think of okay. fungus, okay, there's something growing on it, but Fungus can be spots on leaves, right? Mm -hmm. And and if it's that kind of a if it's that kind of a condition, then it's usually, in fact, I would say always if you have fungus, it's it's an it's a water problem. You have uh -huh. a, if you have a fungus problem on a citrus tree, it's because there's too much water, or the water can't dry out, right? Like uh -huh. maybe there's part of the tree that doesn't get that six hours of sun every day, and Therefore, when it's irrigated, it doesn't really get a chance to dry out, and therefore you end up with fungus. So I would say pay yeah. attention to the to the watering regime, because you know fungus is a it's a cultural problem. It it occurs where there's where there's too much water. Okay, we've got so many other questions. Forgive me if we we don't get to them all. But Leah Schneider, first of all, says she loves your column. Um, and then they have a 60 something year old orange tree never watered. Um, now that produces very little fruit in the last two to three years. Some new blossoms have recently appeared very sparsely. Any hints for Leah on on well, wait a minute. She, she she never waters it. That's she says she never watered. That's maybe the key, right? <laughs> We've had some really the last couple summers have been brutally hot, mm -hmm. and that's the reason that she's not getting more fruit. I mean, see, let's because okay, let's take the navel orange. You know, by the time the summer comes, there's no more fruit on the tree, right? Right. But the way you handle that tree for the next six months is going to determine what kind of flowering and fruiting you get the, the you know, the flowering in the fall and the fruiting in the winter, right? Yeah. So you have to be conscious of that. Just because there's no fruit on the tree doesn't mean uh, you sort of step back and say, oh, I guess I don't have to do anything. I'll just wait for the rain or no. You have to make sure that that tree isn't stressed. You know, it's just like that. <laughs> if you get stressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're not yeah we're not gonna produce you know stress doesn't do that it's good and it doesn't do orange trees any good either 
let's talk about just some general basics for getting for getting them to grow. We have we have a plea from Christina Torres who says she <laughs> loves citrus, especially kumquats, but she's pretty much failed at the process. She's had a dwarf moral blood orange tree in the ground for 10 plus years and never gotten a usable fruit. It flowers, wow. grows small fruit, and then turns black and falls off. Also, <laughs> she mentions the grasshoppers seem to love it and are constantly on that particular tree. She's given. Uh, what, 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 what is it? What do you say? Grass? grass? I didn't. Grasshoppers. Grasshoppers seem to oh, love that tree and are constantly on that particular tree. She's given it citrus fertilizer three times a year. Is it? Is the tree a lost cause? She's had a bit more luck with a dwarf satsuma in the ground, but so far she's really yeah. struggling. So, so you know, it's like you, you really have. You know, it could be something as simple as the tree was planted too deep. I mean. You know, so wow. like, a lot of times if the plant doesn't get off to a good start, it's yeah. like it, it's never going to make it. You know, it's like it's funny with plants. You, you generally know almost at once if this thing is going to make it or not. Maybe yeah. it's not the right spot. Maybe it's is there competition from other plants in the vicinity that can make a big difference. Maybe it's planted next to a fence and there's a tree on the other side of the fence from the neighbor whose roots are undermining it. You know, there, there's so many different variables. That's why it's it's when you just talk about something like in a in a vacuum, you know, I have a tree hasn't been growing for three years. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. You know, I will fertilize it three times a year. That you know that that um, it doesn't give you the whole picture. Yeah. Um, and you know the roots are shallow. And I, is it near a patio? Maybe the roots will grow. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? That there's yeah. so many different so so many different variables. Um, and yeah, well, and a lot of times, and, and sometimes there's really no explanation that that's, that's another, yeah, it's also true. Yeah, it is what it is. Que sera, sera. Listen, <laughs> more specific questions that do have an answer, I'm sure. Claudia uh, Clark asks two questions Are Valencia's included in that quarantine area? Yes, all citrus, yes, all citrus. All citrus. And then yeah. Claudia also wants to know what is the shelf life for a bag of fertilizer? Oh, I don't, I don't know if there's any kind of an expiration on a fertilizer. Interesting. I mean, you know, as long as you're not eating it, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I that. Great tip. Yeah, no, maybe, yeah, I mean, I, I never heard of such a thing, but, you know, especially, I mean, look, if it was a liquid fertilizer, then it, it, it would probably it would probably deteriorate at some point but fertilizer is salt that's what it is yeah does salt have a shelf life no not, it's basically not. that's basically what fertilizer is it's a combination of different salts which when you put them on the ground and you water so the component parts of that salt dissolve right into their component parts and then the part that's necessary by the tree feeds the tree right like you have a nitrate fertilizer so nitrate is no3 you know it has nitrogen and Right. Actually, it's just a, a nitrate it's a salt you know you put it into the ground and you put the water on it and it dissolves and then the nitrogen is taken up by the roots i should have paid more attention in in chemistry class anyway <laughs> and one more question and then we're, and then we'll move on because we're almost done oh my gosh this hour just flies by i, can't Molly, believe it. I know molly levengood asked this question have you addressed curling leaves on the citrus she had a um she, she says her son, uh, I'm sorry, my son said it was citrus blight and to trim curling leaves and spray with mm. organic oil based spray. What to do? Curling wait, wait, leaves. Wait. Because of an oil based spray? No, uh, he, she says her son recommended an oil based spray to cure it. No, no, no. No. That sounds okay. like, look, it's one of two things. It, there's, there's something called Tristasia, which is a virus disease. And that could that could be. I mean, is the tree in decline? That that's really the question. Is it just curling leaves, or is the whole tree in decline? I mean, if it is curling leaves, it could be a virus, and um, there's some, there's not much you can do about it. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. All right. Well, sadly, we're almost uh, out of time. Let's move on to your suggestions about where to go next. Julie, have we got that slide? We'll see. We, oh. we, I'm. I'm sorry, we've we've covered so much ground. I, th I think we've lost her. Oh, there she goes. Ah, so these are some nurseries 
Yeah, that I recommend because uh, they 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 special they have a lot of unusual citrus. The one I would really want to emphasize is the bottom right Laverne Nursery, and I have no connection with them. I, <laughs> but I went to their website. They have so many different varieties of citrus. They're a wholesale grower. You can't buy from them. But what they have is store locator. And I'm telling you, there are, I think, <laughs> a few hundred store. I think they probably supply just about every nursery. The point being, you see a citrus tree that they're growing that you want, and you go to your local store, that, that your local nursery that carries their trees, and you order it. You special order it. You know, there are a lot of exotic citrus, unfortunately, we didn't get into it, like the caviar lime. Give her, <laughs> they're little the fruits. caviar they look like, lime? Yeah, they look oh. like little hot dogs. They look like little hot dogs. Inside, there are little uh, pellets, citrus pellets that look like roe, that look like caviar. Okay. Wow. It's a, what do they it's taste a very like? Tree. Yeah. Is, it's just is it citrusy. something you it's eat? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, it's, it's citrusy. It's, it's a very good. And it's a, you know, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a conversation piece, right? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, there's a lot to explore and I know yeah. that we had more to cover, but please, um, you know, come yeah. back. No, please. send me an email. I, I wish I Oops. Oh, Joshua, I think we lost your audio, sadly. You lost my audio. Oh, there it is. You're back again. Well, I'm sorry. What were you saying? No, I'm saying I, I, I strongly uh, urge anybody who did, whose question wasn't answered, or maybe they asked the question and I didn't answer it completely because I didn't know the whole situation, send me an email and I'll answer your question. So maybe you could bring that up on the, on the slide, I, you know, the email. It's we, just Joshua. I, I there we, we go. Have it. Joshua. Yeah, we have it. Please. Yeah, yeah. There's so much to go over. Listen, thank you so much. Really, that's all the time we have today, folks. I'm so sorry. Thanks again, Joshua. Uh, okay, my just, pleasure. just, just so you know, his, Joshua's column runs in Saturday's paper and online and all of our publications. His website is thesmartergardener.com. We just had that slide up. Yeah, there it is. And if, if you want have, more garden, oh, go ahead. No, we have to give a shout out to Julie. Corlett, Corlett. Because she's the one who did the slides and she's like Julie Corlett is our is our Oz behind the curtain she's our production manager <laughs> thank you Julie you had a lot to juggle today as you always do so thanks again um yeah. I want I want to say if you if you want more gardening insight from our experts sign up for the garden party newsletter check that out and and uh and it might be a good time to catch up on our virtual programs you missed this year. So go to scng.com forward slash virtual events for all the stuff that you missed. If you'd like to share your thoughts from today, and we hope that you do, or you have additional questions, please email us at events at scng.com. Our next uh, program next month will be all about the birds and the bees help the flowers and the trees. I'm trying not to sing that one. <laughs> and um, if you're not a subscriber, but want to get in on all the entertainment and information we offer, give us a call at 877-469-6133. Anyway, thanks again, Joshua. It's always a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thanks, it's a pleasure thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye. Okay.